it's hard to know exactly why Kamala is beholden to the Islamist wing of the party, but she clearly is. Kamala's speech last night was seen as a success by many Democrats. They think she's had a great convention. What's your take on it? Well, of course they would. <laughs> um, you know, I thought her delivery was fine, which is, you know, that's actually in itself a big accomplishment because she's so derided so often for her delivery and for coming across as kind of inane. Um, so I give her points for her delivery. But again, you know, she really didn't touch on concrete policy issues. I think she's still evading. Uh, the heart of the matter. I think she's doing a lot to cover up her actual extremism. And, you know, truly the most important thing here is not the speeches, but the Democrats' platform. And if you read that platform, um, it, is, it is really frightening. And I think Americans see this. I think today, probably because it's the day after her speech, is probably going to be the highest point in her approval rating. And I think from here on out, it can only slide as people recognize more and more the types of policies she and her vice president, Tim Walz, uh, are proposing. And I also have to say, what's very interesting to me is more and more is coming out about Waltz's extremism as well. Um, I think today there's a, a, a new piece that's found a, an article that he wrote or was written about him as a teacher back in 1991, where he was teaching all about Mao's communism uh, and saying that in China, all people are equal and get the same amount and people share with each other. And, you know, Americans are not stupid, right? <laughs> they know that what happens in communist China is not that kind of a rosy picture. So again, I think as, as this spreads and as more people wake up to this, um, I think it's going to be really big trouble for the Democrats. So it's interesting you say that today is Kamala Harris's peak day and it's all downhill from here. So do you think that she has got a struggle heading into November, particularly on the issues of the economy and immigration and so on? Look, what I'm hearing is people are, I, I think that the number one issue for most people is illegal immigration. And the reason for that is it's hitting people in their neighborhoods. We are just getting countless stories of people being in car accidents, for example, being hit by illegal aliens, um, people being robbed. We've had just recently where I live in Fairfax County, we had a really brutal murder where it turns out um, the two perpetrators had been picked up by police numerous times and released. Um, so you've got that hitting people. We've got another story here in Fairfax County where they are now starting to change the boundaries for public school districts. Um, and the reason they're doing that is we have such a high number of non-English speakers, of illegal aliens in some of our schools that those schools are, are at risk of losing their accreditation. So it's affecting people in schools. We've got, you know, so many people, illegal aliens, uh, crowding our hospitals because they don't have health insurance. So here the fallback is to go to an emergency room. That's putting a heavy burden on our medical system. So you see, it's hitting us in so many places. So I think this is the really big concern for Americans. Um, the economy, of course, is another really big issue. Um, people are, you, you can't avoid the inflation. I mean, gas when Trump left was maybe what, $1.85 a gallon, we're at about three sixty-five right now. Um, you see it everywhere. You see it in the grocery store. So I think this is going to be a big factor. But again, I think that the biggest thing really is that many, many, many Americans see that what Waltz and Harris are proposing is a fundamentally different view of the United States. They really do want to push us towards socialism. And I know that there are people here, unfortunately, who embrace that, who are ignorant about the past, and they will go with that. But most Americans understand that that is fundamentally opposed to what the United States really stands for and what's great about the United States. And I think they're going to vote against that. And I'll, I'll tell you one of the most interesting um, voter demographics with that regard are, are legal immigrants, right? So 
Here in Fairfax County, which is Northern Virginia, I'm just outside of Washington, D.C., we're the biggest county in Virginia, 30% of our citizens were not born in this country, right? They have come here from other countries, and many of them are really successful. We have many doctors, engineers, sort of, you know, data and tech people, a lot of really successful people. Again and again, they say to me, we did not come here to be in a communist country, right? We did not come here for socialism. We came here for opportunity. We came here for meritocracy. I think she's going to lose all of those voters as well. So, yes, I think it's going to be a downward slide from here. Is Kamala a communist? You look at her price control policy, and I know Donald Trump has been tweeting about her being a communist. What do you make of that argument? Yeah, I mean, I I would say this. I would make this distinction. I think her policies are communist. Uh, I don't think she would self-identify as a communist. Tim Waltz, I'm not so sure. I mean, he he has really openly and repeatedly um, touted Chinese communism. So somewhere deep inside, he may say he's a communist. Kamala, I, I don't think so. But she is, her policies that she's advocating are 100% socialist. And, you know, again, I think out of her ignorance, she is missing the great point that the Austrian economist Friedrich von Hayek made that was so important, which is you cannot control a country's economy without controlling everything about the country because you can't separate out the economy, right? People's economic behavior is not separated from any other aspect of their life. And so, you know, again, I think she's falling into that trap that. I would say many people around the world fell into back in the 30s and 40s before they really woke up to the cruel reality of what socialism does to a country. I think she truly believes this is a kinder, gentler way to run a country. Uh, But we know what it leads to. And, you know, we've got a great example of it sitting right down below our southern border in Venezuela. So I don't think I just don't think people are going to go for this. We've seen at the convention lots of protests from so-called pro-Gaza, pro-Palestinian uh, radical protesters. Um, on Monday, Joe Biden actually praised these protesters, said that they had a point, um, uh, and other Democrats have said similar things. Kamala Harris didn't appoint uh, Josh Shapiro, a Jewish person, to be her vi- uh, vice presidential nominee. So do you think that Kamala Harris is beholden to the radical Islamists? One hundred percent. And I think that and I can't tell you why I don't I can't tell you if it's because of money coming from Iran or other places, you know, and I I will just say it's really worth keeping an eye on the current investigations on Act Blue, the big Democrat fundraising app. So, as I said, I think it's it's hard to know exactly why Kamala is beholden to the Islamist wing of the party, but she clearly is. And I, I think they've got the Democrats over a barrel because either they're going to alienate a, a big chunk of their voters, which are secular Jewish voters, or they're going to alienate their let's say, Muslim or the radical kind of pro-Hamas wing, I don't see how they resolve this. What kind of parallels do you make between these current protests now and historic protests and democratic conventions and so on? Yeah, so I'm very interested in this question because, as you know, I, I recently published a book called Next Gen Marxism, and I did a very, very deep dive into the radicalism of the 1960s. And I see very strong parallels between what's happening today and what happened back then. You had a very robust radical student movement in the 60s. Uh, They were absolutely Marxist at their core. Their key issues at the time were civil rights and ending the Vietnam War. But they were really clear that they wanted more than that. They, They wanted the United States as we know it gone. They wanted a Marxist revolution, right? And I think we are in the same place today. I think you have this a big, I would say somewhat student-based movement, but I think you've got a lot of other groups involved as well. 
they are using right now Gaza, but they've used other issues as their lever, their wedge issue, race, ethnicity, sexuality. Um, but those are tools for what they really want, which is Marxist revolution. They want power. They want Marxism. They want a Marxist revolution. They want to fundamentally change the system. What I find really interesting, so, you know, the protesters today have made very clear references to the protests of 1968. They've got a poster that says, make it great, like 68, um, which I find really interesting because actually what happened in 68 and then subsequent protests again in 69 was actually the downfall of the student revolution. Um, they had the big violent, very violent revolutions of 1968 at the Democrat National Convention at that time. And that kind of emboldened them. But the following year, they did a sort of a reprise of that uh, protest. And they thought, this is our moment. Everybody's going to come together for this great protest. They expected hundreds, if not thousands of people. Only about 300 people showed up. And they were sort of I would say, in turn, attacked themselves. Like, apparently, they had onlookers throwing rocks at them. People in Chicago did not want this happening in their streets, and it really turned people against them. And after that, they had to disband. And some of them went underground, formed the terrorist group, the Weather Underground. But it was really marked the beginning of the end for the student protests. I find it so interesting that this week they expected what, 30, 50,000 protesters, they got a few thousand. I think we might be seeing the same thing today. Earlier you were talking about Tim Waltz and his praising the Chinese. People have been asking questions about his links with China. He's been taking a few plane trips over there, and there are questions over who were funding his um, trips to China. What do you think is going on there? Yeah, I think it's not just a few plane trips. If I'm not mistaken, he's gone 31 times. Um, so I think initially he spent a year there as a, as an exchange student. Um, a lot of people have also commented on the fact that he and his wife got married on the anniversary of Tiananmen Square. And, and he's alleged to have said something like, I wanted a date I could remember. I, I don't know if that's true. Um, and he's, you know, the most important thing, though, is he has come out and and on multiple occasions said things in praise of China, in praise of socialism. You know, the infamous one now, you know, one man's socialism is another man's neighborliness, uh, you know, right, until they start executing you, right, until they show up at your house at two in the morning and pull you out of your house and throw you in a prison and torture you. Um, I, I don't know what's behind it, but honestly, I get the sense that he's just, he's a believer. You know, I, I think that for whatever reason, I mean, I don't, you know, when you, if you go over as a student, I don't think anybody's buying you out at that stage. You know, if he had started this being enthralled with China as a politician, I might feel it very differently. And we certainly have plenty who go soft on China because, you know, it's clearly to their benefit. Um, I don't think that's his case, unfortunately. I think he really believes um, the lies that China dishes out about what kind of system it is, which is, that's scary for us. Let's talk about the border. Under Kamala Harris, who was appointed the so-called border czar by President Biden, um, there's been millions of illegal immigrants coming into the United States through the southern border. How has this impacted America over the last few years? Look, it's been impacting us for years. Um, and I, you know, I, I have to be really upfront. I was very deeply involved with this in the Trump administration because I was a, an appointee at the Department of Homeland Security and then later at Customs and Border Protection. I went down to the border. I visited the border. I was, you know, in the, the processing stations. Um, I saw thousands of, you know, people, including kids, coming through the border. Um, and I was also part of the effort to see that the wall got built. Um, so I've seen this up close and personal for a while now. And to, to me, you know, look, this was this was a problem before Trump came in. I thought it was one of President Trump's greatest achievements. 
And let me say, it is not easy to close that flow. You know, a lot of people think, ah, just build the wall and it stops. No, I mean, he implemented an array of probably 20 different policies, you know, to help slow down the flow and, and stop the flow. And, you know, the famous slide that he showed, the thing that actually saved his life, right? When he turned his head in Butler, it's because he was showing this extraordinary slide. He showed it again in Milwaukee at the convention that showed the number of people hitting the border under his presidency. And it had he had gotten it down to an incredibly low number by the time he left. And then, of course, Biden undid all of it, and it shot way up. Um, and now, one of the things that I find really stunning is, you know, I talk to people on the left, and they have said to me that border crossings under Biden are actually lower than under Trump, which, you know, look, this is three quarters of our problem, is the way in which the left lies and in which the mainstream media will lie on their behalf. It is patently not true. The numbers under Biden have been incredible. And I think most people know that. And as I was saying earlier, you know, it, it's impossible with the numbers where they are. And some people are estimating it's as high as 40 million who have come into this country illegally. Nobody really knows. Um, they use one number, 12 million. They've been using the same number for years, like as if it hasn't grown. Um, I've heard it as high as 40 million. But as I was saying earlier, it is touching many, many, many Americans in their everyday lives. Um, and that's why, personally, I think the border is the number one issue. And I think it's going to really hurt the Democrats because people do look at Kamala and it, it, people really do look at her and say, you had a job to do as the borders are and you didn't do it. What do you think is behind this? Is this a political calculation that they think that this will help them in future elections if they bring in more immigrants and so on? I cannot think of any other reason. Because I'm, I'm, te I'm telling you, if you go there, you see the, the biggest heartbreak about this. It's not that we can't absorb them, right? We are a huge country. All you have to do is fly over West Virginia or any other state, pretty much, and you realize we have plenty of space here. That's not the problem. For me, the, the, one of the biggest problems with the open border is it is an incentive for child trafficking. And, and that's a big part of what's happening. There is an incentive for people to exploit children because one of the Democrat policies was families will not split up. So if you come over alleging that you are a man and a woman or even just with a child or even just a man and a child, you won't be split up, you will be let in as opposed to before a man coming alone would be sent back, right? Um, and so it's an incredible incentive for child trafficking, and that's a lot of what we're seeing. So I don't understand. To, to, to me, it's like a real hypocrisy, I think, from the left, um, you know, who, who claims to be more caring or whatever, um, that, that they know and that they're causing this grave crisis for children, uh, but yet they keep letting it happen. And... I can't think of any other reason except that the only way they can win is with those votes. Thank you so much for joining us. Appreciate your time. So happy to be here. Thanks for having me.